Well, thank you so much. Very, very, very nice of you to say nice things about me. When it's your turn, I will promise to do the same. Welcome, tree. No, that's Ellis. This is the tree. <laughs> Thanks, Ellis. Uh, the Lord's got a, a passage in John chapter 15 on my heart this morning. Spent time seeking the Lord for the congregation and what is on his heart for you guys today. So I believe it's from his spirit. I need to start by honoring my parents who are in the house. Tom and Diane Fitzgerald. Um, amazing, amazing saints who set a foundation of faith in the lives of their children that um, is a ripple effect in many, many places. And uh, so grateful for the heritage of faith. So thanks, mom and dad, very much. Thank you, thank you. So the Lord said to me, um, I believe this is prophetic, he said, speak to the branches and say, it's time. It's time. The time has come to bear much fruit. Speak to the branches, you're the branches, and say, it's time. Somebody say, it's time. time. Say it like you mean it. It's It's time time. to bear much fruit. Not just a little. I'm talking about a lot of fruit. And we're going to talk a little bit about what that means. The Lord said this. He said, there's been a lot of wondering Have I missed it? And the Lord's answer is, some things have passed by, but others, this is the good part, even more and better, even more and better, even more and better are about to come to pass. Then his exhortation again, bear much fruit. Last week, Steve Stone had a prophetic word I'm just going to read this to you. Please just bear with me. There's a little bit of reading to get started here. Steve prophesied this. He said, The word that I've given you today is one of hope, victory, and grace. A vintage this land has not known for a while and may not know for a while. But you are the new wine, and you bring that message. You go into the darkness that does not make you tremble, but if you look, you will see people who are crushed by it, bring that wine. They will drink and they will be renewed. For understand, this is not just where you go to your happy place. (laughs) This is real. This is new. This is a vintage that has not yet been harvested to the full or tasted to the full, but will be needed in the land that you are standing in. So go with a full barrel, a fresh squeeze, For it not only comes from me, it is inside of you. Harvest that stuff, squeeze that stuff, for it is a vintage that will draw people to the light and out of the darkness. It is a vintage that will draw people to the light and out of darkness. And part of why this building was built the way it was is that we'd be a city on a hill, that we would lift up the cross of Christ And our prayer was that we draw all men unto him, the Lord Jesus Christ. And you are a vintage, something necessary in the world today. The Lord has need of you. He has need of the fruit that your life must bear as a Christ follower. And it is time to bear much fruit. There's many reasons to bear fruit. We're going to talk about what that means. But one of the most compelling is that we would be light in the darkness. So let's get into our main text. If you can, stand and read John chapter 15, verses 1 through 8 with me. This is the New King James Version. I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered, and they gather them and they throw them into the fire and they are burned. 
If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. By this, my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit, so you will be my disciples. You may be seated. There's like 20 messages in those eight verses. And I cut it down. I had uh, 9, 10, and 11 in there too. And I just went, you know what? I can't do that. I can't talk that fast. So I got a picture of this grapevine, this vineyard up there. I think this is my belief. God's got a garden. We were birthed into the Garden of Eden as mankind. And that garden is a perfect expression of God's desire for our place, our physical place, and our spiritual place in relationship with him and relationship with each other. But as you all know, we don't live in that garden anymore. Some things have changed. But I believe we do have a new Eden. I believe that there is a garden of God that is not natural, but it transcends into the supernatural. Psalm 91 says this, it says, he who dwells in the secret place shall abide in the shadow of the Almighty. What's the secret place? What is the secret place? I believe that the secret place is the Garden of Eden, it's the Garden of God, where you can go now And if you do this with me, please, it's not some weird trick. You don't need music. You don't need a song. But there's a place that is yours and God's only. Only. And it may take a passcode to get into it. It may take some digging for you to find it. It may be the door to the secret garden and some vines have overgrown it. But we all have it because God says that he set eternity in the hearts of men. So he who dwells in the secret place shall abide in the shadow of the Almighty. In this secret place, God's got a vineyard. And in that vineyard is this vine and the branch. And he speaks to us there. It's a personal, devoted relationship with God. Where I abide in him and he abides in me. And it is pointless to try to produce fruit as a Christian without knowing how to get to this place. So we try to cultivate it corporately in worship, but the song alone can't do it. It takes us engaging God in that place that only we're allowed into and only he can access with us. And if we're patient there, not only can we speak to him, but he can speak to us. Shall abide in the shadow of the Almighty. Shall abide in the shadow of the Almighty. If you don't know what that place is or how to access it, it means that you've got an opportunity in front of you and I hope that by the end we'll provide that opportunity for you. We are in a new Eden if you know how to access it. A place of oneness with Jesus and intimacy with God, a place where we can't hide from him and where we reap the maximum benefit of being in his presence and in an intertwined relationship with the Son. Today we're gonna emphasize the role of the vine dresser in the story we just read. So what's in this vineyard? Number one, Jesus. He says, I'm the true vine. So this is a really fascinating word study. I dug into this. True in the Greek means true. And then vine, of course, means vine. So I just, right there, my mind just, and I, I don't know if we can keep going. True and vine. It's actually a phrase with the emphasis on the word true, meaning there's many counterfeits, and Jesus was trying to make it very, very plain to his disciples and his followers We pick up the story of this after Jesus has had the triumphal entry, after he's washed his disciples' feet, after he's promised the coming of the Holy Spirit. And this is the part of his ministry where he's emphasizing very, very, very hard the oneness, the sameness of God the Son and God the Father. 
that he's come to do the Father's will, but he is, in fact, the bread, the manna from heaven that has come down that preexisted with the Father and is now God incarnate here on earth. And Jesus is really trying to emphasize, you have not followed a counterfeit, and this would be tested to its full because he was about to be crucified and forsaken by everyone who was in it for something they could get out of it. There must be counterfeits. So in Mir, we talk about broken cisterns from Romans. It talks about vessels that were made to hold water and sustenance, but have become cracked and no longer can hold water. And so when you go to them for that very source of life that you need, you find that they're empty and unable to provide what you're really after. Jesus, the true vine. So Jesus, the vine in this. Can we go back to that picture? Look how rugged that vine is. It's been there a while. It's been there a while. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and we'll get into that a little bit too. It's an amazingly rugged and strong source for something, a fruit that's so very, very delicate, something that it produces that can be so easily bruised or harmed or injured. God, the Father, is the vine dresser. I like this. So another word for vine dresser is husband or husbandry. And the Greek word for this is a fun word study because it's a word called gorgeous. Can you say, God's my gorgeous husband? I like it's pretty good. I really like that. It's my gorgeous. It's gorgeous. That's husband. The definition of a husband is someone who cares, who cultivates, breeds crops and animals. His job is the management and conservation of resources. Here's my observation. There is no garden without God. There's no garden without God. We can't access the garden without Jesus, but there's no garden without God. God created a place of intimacy for us, and that's his kindness expressed to us. It's his intention for us to exist and to thrive within that garden. There is no garden without God. There's an attempt in Christianity to write God out of the story, that we have this emphasis, and rightly so, on the work of Jesus and the cross, because he loves us, he sustains us, he's our root, he's where we get our water and our nutrients and our supply. But that vine needed a garden, and the garden was made by God. And God in this story is very, very important to Jesus. He makes it plain that there's three parts. There's the branch, there's the vine, and there's the vine dresser. The vine dresser. Us, I'm sorry, and we're the branches. There's not a lot to it. A branch is a limb or a shoot, and our entire purpose is to produce fruit. The vine dresser, his jobs. There's two jobs explicitly listed in John chapter 15 that is the job of the vine dresser. But how many of you know that when you read the Bible, there's what the words say and then there's the white space? So we're gonna talk about what's explicitly stated and then we're gonna talk about what's implicitly stated. Explicitly stated, every branch of me that does not bear fruit, job one, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, job two, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. God removes what doesn't produce. So turn to your neighbor and say, don't be a sucker. <laughs> Come on, don't be a sucker. Don't, not the kind Pastor Phil gives out after service. Don't be a sucker. All right, I took a picture of a tree at my house. I'm a master gardener. I don't know if you know or not. I've pruned this tree so well that it will not produce fruit this year at all. I, uh, I have a vision there. It's kind of like my little bonsai tree. <laughs> I'm less concerned that this tree produces fruit than that I don't hit a car backing out of my driveway. So I try really hard to make it sight lines. All right, so the suckers, uh, I don't think this tree will produce any fruit. I didn't see it flower, and we'll talk about that too. The suckers are the little red circles down there. Can we zoom in on those? That's a sucker. Don't be a sucker. Suckers show up after the fact. They come as the season goes on, they're not gonna flower and they have zero potential to produce fruit. We call branches that don't produce suckers and I felt like one during COVID. I don't know if any of you can relate to that but man, when the church had to seriously shut down and the business I ran uh, came under some significant uh, restrictions, I was feeling like where in the world is my place? I felt like um, I wasn't producing much of anything. I really felt like a sucker. The question that came into my mind is, how can you be in Jesus? Because that's what he says. No branch in me um, 
that doesn't produce fruit will remain. So how can you be in Jesus and not produce fruit? And what I, of all the crazy things that came to mind, I don't know if you guys remember your college study groups, but you'd always have that really enthusiastic person that's like, hey, let's get a study group together. We'll work on this together. Like, okay, yeah, you bet, we'll do that. And so they gather together all the best students in the class, and then they, all those students produce the answers for the person who started the group, and the person who started the group wasn't actually interested in doing any of the work. Their work was to get the group together so they could have all the answers. And I bet Dr. Peter back there has probably been a part of a couple of those study groups where he provided answers for people. You feel taken advantage of, um, but suckers don't do well when the test comes because the test is to produce fruit. So just knowing the answer isn't gonna get you through the test. You can be in Jesus for what's in it for you. You can be in Jesus for what's in it for you. I'm speaking to a congregation that's 50 years old, right? I would imagine over time you've probably come across some people who are in Jesus for what was in it for them. We want the benefits of the cross, the salvation, the community, but we don't want the service, the sacrifice, the laying down my life for one another, Amen. for moving the mission of the gospel forward. I was thinking about my streaming services. Like I've got Netflix and Hulu, we've got, um, what's the audio one? Um, Spotify, I even have Audible, I forgot I have that. One of the things that the little financial advisors tell you to do is go through and list all your streaming services because you're probably not using two of them and you should cancel them. Um, so that's for free, just take that for what it's worth. When, when they stop being useful to you, you stop going to them. I, I don't know how it's possible, but you get to a place where you've seen just about everything you think Netflix has to offer. You're like, I, it's amazing. I don't think I've watched that much TV, but you kind of get to that place where you're like, I'm sort of done with you. And when it served its purpose, you discard it. My observation is a sucker is only in it for what is in it for them. A sucker is only in it for what is in it for them. This is why the Lord prunes. This is why he prunes, because he's concerned for what will bear fruit. This is a really, really difficult job. Jesus says, I didn't come into the world to judge the world. That job belongs to his dad. And it should only belong to his dad. That's not a space I ever want to occupy. But God in his infinite wisdom holds that place. Then he prunes what does produce. Hallelujah. You thought you were all free, right? Hallelujah. Well, I'm at church today. I'm producing fruit. I'm good. I'm not going to get cut off. But he will prune you. He will prune you. How do we produce fruit? By abiding. These are intimidating pieces, aren't they? Oh my gosh. I thought, Pastor Kerry, what do you think? Do you like this one? <laughs> we got it out of the catwalk, so it's seriously not bearing any fruit. Um, he prunes, not yet, not yet, tree. That must be the fig tree that he digs around and exposes the root and he gives it one more year because it's going to get grace right now. <laughs> abiding. Abiding is how we produce fruit. Abiding seems a little ambiguous to me. When I was reading this, I'm going, abide, abide. He who dwells in the secret place shall abide in the shadow of the Almighty. That's the Old Testament. What about the New Testament? Abide in me. And my words abide in you. You will bear much fruit. You will bear much fruit. That abide is meno, to stay to stay in a given place, state, relation, or expectancy, abide, continue, dwell, endure, be present, remain, stand, tarry. Living Faith Fellowship, you have stayed. You've stayed in a given place. Many of you have been called to this house, and you've been diligent to stay in it. A state of relation. You've worked hard at the relationships God's given you. You've not allowed offenses, the foxes, to spoil the vine. You've stayed in a state of relation. You've stayed in a state of expectancy. There's not a person in this room that doesn't believe that God does miracles, amen? amen. 
Come on, Living Faith Fellowship. You have stayed. You have stayed. You've abided. You've continued. You've dwelled. You've endured. You've been present. You've shown up. You've remained. You've stood. And in the presence of the Lord, you have tarried. Well, Well done. Well done. It was a little boy's lunch that fed 5,000. It was a little boy's offering that said, if you can use it, you can have it. A productive Christian life is not the byproduct of trying, but of trusting. Productive Christian life is the byproduct of trusting and not trying. You've abided. When God tells us to produce fruit, he isn't saying double down and try harder. When God tells you to produce fruit and says it's a requirement or you run the risk of being cut off, what he's saying is, I've given you everything you need and all I need you to do is abide in my son and you will bear much fruit. My time with Jesus, do we have that form? Can we put that up? How many of you remember this form? Can you see it? So it's a cheap shot, but how many of you, how many of you have spent time with the Lord this morning? Don't raise your hand, it's okay. How many of you plan to do it before the night's over now that I said it? How do you abide? You make a place, you make space, and you stay in the presence of the Lord. I was given these when I first came here as a little tool, and in it, it tells me that I've got to start with the Word of God. I have to start with the Word of God because it grounds me. That way, what the Lord is saying to me isn't based on the Cheetos that aren't sitting quite right in my stomach. And then as I read the word of God, I'm listening for what promises I can enjoy, what command can I obey, what sin should I avoid, and what lesson can I learn. And then when I get to the back, I've got an opportunity to confess as the Holy Spirit's moved on my life and shown me things that don't please him. And then I get to say something positive, a positive confession, and it just leads me through this. Lord, in you, I'm more than a conqueror. Lord, I am your son and I am your child. And then I get to thank him for the work that he's done and then I get to ask him my supplication and then I get to adore him as a hero, a lamb, a shepherd, a king, a castle, a fortress, a strong tower, a refuge, a warrior. And then I sit and I listen for him and he'll speak to me. And when I've done that, I have done what Romans 15 exhorts us to do, to abide in the Lord and let his word abide in me. I'm having a hard time finding these around our church anymore. And what I think is, I think it gets pretty easy to become casual about abiding. But if it's necessary for us to bear fruit, and the way to bear fruit is to abide, I think we ought to see more of these floating around again. They are online. And we've got them. We're going to print them up for you guys. I just think it's so powerful if you don't know how to spend time with the Lord. Some of you have been doing this so long, it just falls out of you and you don't need it anymore. But I like it as a refresher, even if I have been doing it for a long time. This is how you can abide. If it's that important and you go, my goodness, I have to do this in order to bear fruit, I, I'm just saying this is a little method that can help you get along the way. It isn't that this makes it happen, it's that this facilitates what's supposed to happen because the secret place is right there. The secret place is right there. I think I turned the page too early. Yes, I did. Um, he's pruning. The definition of pruning is cutting away dead or over, overgrown branches or stems, especially to increase fullness, fruitfulness, and growth. So he's cutting things off. He cuts things off of us. What does he cut off? Those things that hinder the branch's ability to bear the best possible fruit. The best possible fruit. So that's quality and that's quantity. He cuts off things that help us to increase our quantity and our quality. And I can't tell you who brings about sickness or disease. I can't tell you who brings about the adversity. 
I can't tell you in your particular circumstance if that was the devil or if that was the Lord, but I do know this. He's able to work all things together for good for those who know him and love him and are called according to his purposes. So is it safe to call those things if they're working things out of your life, attitudes, sins, um, all kinds of things, the work of the Lord? I think, yeah, and that's just a demonstration of the graciousness of his power that he would use all things to draw us closer to him. He's cutting off. But you can feel, like Pastor Steve said last Sunday, you can feel naked when you get pruned. <laughs> you could feel real naked. I, I've done some pruning that by the time I was done, the tree does not look better for the pruning I did. It looks worse. You can feel exposed. When the Lord cuts something off, you can feel awkward. You can feel all of a sudden inadequate. You will feel loss. Many times what the Lord cuts off is something you've invested an awful lot into. Uh, Maybe it was um, an education track you were on, college student, and the Lord says, that was good, but we're going another direction now. Maybe it was an athletic pursuit, and you were certain you were at the next Barry Bonds or the next whatever, and it turns out the Lord says, nope, but you'll make a good dad. I'm changing plans. He cuts things off that are valuable to us and will feel the sense of loss on that. You may even feel stunted. You may even feel restrained or held back. This is all the goodness of God. That's all the goodness of God. Some of you who are struggling with habitual sin that you feel like you can't get out of your life and you feel like you haven't produced fruit in over a year. Well, some trees need pruning that keep them from fruit for a year. But watch out for the next year because he knows what he's doing and he's arrived at at, at an image of you that takes some time to cultivate and he's being faithful to you to get you there. So my observation here is don't mistake pruning for being cut off. The work of the devil in condemnation would tell you that you're fruitless and the Lord has no purpose for you and you're done and he's gonna cut you off and he's gonna bundle you in with the branches and into the fire with you. But what the Lord is doing is he's restraining some things so that other things can grow stronger and take their rightful place. In fact, it should prove exactly the opposite. Don't mistake pruning, a pruning cut for being cut off. His job implicit, so this is the white space. Specifically, it says he cuts off what doesn't bear fruit. Specifically, it says he prunes what does. Well, he tends the soil. A plant needs good soil. It needs water and nutrients. He pulls the weeds. Anybody had God pull some weeds out of their life? Maybe God specifically pulled weed out of your life, right? (laughs) Just because it's legal doesn't mean it's right. He fights off the buzzards. Because even when you produce fruit, things that shouldn't get it, want it. He removes the pests. He ensures exposure to the sun, S-O-N-S-U-N, and he does it all the time. Here's the other thing he does, because his role seems so judgmental, so final, but it really is all his goodness. Here's what he's also doing all the time, and praise the Lord, he grafts new branches in. Just in case you thought he was being tough, he's constantly grafting new branches in. I have that image there. Do you have that? Isn't that beautiful? He's got this vine in his son that's created access to him, and he is constantly taking new branches who will take him at his word, and he's grafting them in. This to me looked like God's using the scraps of the grave clothes of Jesus, and he's using them to tie a new branch on. And I just thought, that is such a cool image. I really, really like that. I must abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I must dwell in the secret place. And you are, and I am, called to produce fruit. Not by might, not by power, but by the Spirit. And I believe the word of the Lord for us as a church is, it's time. It's time. 
to bear much fruit. An old vine is 50 years old or older. A new vine won't produce a usable crop until about year two or three. And it produces a ton of grapes. So that new vigorous vine, that new vigorous branch in the Lord can produce a lot of fruit. But what's really sought after is the quality of a vine that's 50 years old. We're 50 years old. It's jubilee for us right now. This is highly sought after. I don't know anything about vines. I just started looking this stuff up, and the Lord showed this to me. 50 years old, jubilee, that's where we're at as a church. It produces less grapes, but it produces much higher quality grapes. You can taste, you can taste the difference. The experience in someone's life can be tasted in the fruit. And that's called wisdom. And I'm around some people who have a tremendous amount of wisdom in the Lord. God is producing a special vintage, like Steve's word from the Lord was for us. So speak to the vine and tell it, it's time to bear much fruit. God has seen your abiding, and it has brought about the opportunity and occasion, and it is time to bear much fruit. I don't know what that means for you. I have no idea. But the Holy Spirit has some things in your heart that the Lord says it's time for. It's time. The time isn't lost. It's not too late. But it's time now. Just as the wind of the Spirit was said prophetically to be blowing across the coals, that's what the Holy Spirit is doing right now in your heart. It's time. It is time to bear much more and greater fruit. So I'd like to ask you, what is it time for? For you, what's the Lord called you to? What does he need you to say yes to? as you've abide, abided and stayed in his presence, what's the Holy Spirit saying? It's time, it's time, it's time. I believe his promise is this, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, what that's time for, you can be sure that it will bear much fruit, that the Lord wants to do a work with your yes, with your obedience, with the fruitfulness of your abiding that will not only be marginally successful, but will be abundantly successful. I believe the Lord says it's time. You may be another category of person. You may have found yourself spinning your wheels, trying hard to make something of this life. Maybe you're a parent chasing kids and um, you're not sure you're doing it right. You're not even sure um, if you're really honest that you're in the right place. College student, you don't know why you're studying what you're studying, you just thought you're supposed to. And the Lord wants to breathe purpose into your life. He says that if you'll abide in him, you'll bear much fruit. What that means is, is I've got to go to him and I've got to surrender my plans to him. I've got to go to him and I've got to tell him that I'm done with my ways. I'm done with my plans. I'm done with trying to figure it out for myself. And I'm ready to trust him with my whole life. Because he says, I am the true vine. There's popularity, there's power, there's position. There's all kinds of things that you can chase out there, but they're just a vapor or a shadow and they disappear as fast as you grab a hold of it. But Jesus will not. Jesus will answer the deepest thirst of your soul if you will simply abide in him. And the Lord's promise is this, you will live a fruitful life if you'll choose to put your trust in him. So today, my observations are God is glorified when we bear much fruit. We are in God's garden, a new Eden, there's no garden without God. 
But soccer is in it only for what is in it for them. A productive Christian life is the byproduct of trusting and not trying. And experience can be tasted in the fruit. So don't mistake pruning, a pruning cut for being cut off. If you haven't ever trusted the Lord Jesus with your life, he's calling you to it. And if you will come today to this altar, there'll be people here who will pray with you who will be delighted to show you how to access that secret place that I started with today. What does it mean to abide in the shadow of the Almighty? They'll show you how. And it's amazing. It's amazing. And for the rest of us, bear much fruit. Amen. Thank you so much. Amen.